Welcome to the Great Coaches Podcast. To me, being perfect is not about that scoreboard out there. This is a chance of a lifetime. When you can understand the person, you can then work towards a common goal. We are all on the same team. Now you roll and do it to the best of your ability. Focus on the fundamentals. We've gone over time and time again. Your defense has got to be better. Leave no doubt tonight. Great moments are born from great opportunity. Hello and welcome to the Great Coaches Podcast. My name is Paul Barnett and here we believe that there is no algorithm for leadership and so we interview great sports coaches from around the world to try and find ideas to help all of us be better leaders. Our great coach on this episode is Lynn Dunn. Lynn is an American basketball coach. She coached for 25 seasons at the college level, winning 447 games and going to the NCAA championship on seven occasions. She then went on to be the first coach and GM of the Seattle Storm in the WNBA, bringing superstars Lauren Jackson and Sue Bird into the team. In 2009, she was then appointed head coach of the Indiana Fever And in 2012, that team went on to win the WNBA championship. She has also coached at the Olympics and World Championships with the USA women's team and has been named Coach of the Year on four occasions and is a member of seven different athletic halls of fame. At 74 years of age, she has now returned to the Indiana Fever as their GM. And just before we go to the interview... Today's podcast is brought to you by the Macquarie University Business School's MBA program. Designed to empower, challenge and transform, the Macquarie MBA gives you the business skills and knowledge you need to succeed in an evolving global economy. The program bridges the gap between theory and real-world application, bringing together world-leading professors, executives and industry partners to teach you how business can be used for good. I have just started working with the team at Macquarie on some projects and can attest to the quality of the people and material. To find out more, search for Macquarie University Business School's MBA. And now, please enjoy our interview with Lynn Dunn. You're listening to The Great Coaches Podcast. Lynn Dunn, good morning. And welcome to the Great Coaches Podcast. Good morning. Great to chat. Could you tell us where you are in the world and what you've been up to so far today? Well, today I am in South Florida, um, but I will be returning back to Tennessee uh, shortly in the next 24 hours. Um, And then I will head back to Indiana uh, as we start the second half of the fever season. Yeah, well, we're going to talk about your latest job, but I would like to start by just talking about a few of the all-time great coaches that you've had a first-hand experience with. John Wooden, Bobby Knight, Dean Smith, and of course, from a different uh, sport, Red Auerbach. Lynn, they're amazing people. And I know that you've met so many other coaches on your journey, which we're going to get into, but what do you think the great coaches do differently that sets them apart? Um, wow, that's a great question. And you just listed some of my heroes when you, when you met, mentioned that list. Uh, I would also add uh, probably Pat Riley to that list, and I would probably add um, uh, Hubie Brown. Those two had a, a, a huge impact on, on my career. Um, well, gosh, don't underestimate Vince Lombardi, you know, and what he did with the Green Bay Packers. All, all of those – uh, coaches, those successful coaches have had an impact on me because I've read their books, you know, I've read about their life. Um, and so I've taken a piece, I think, from every one of them, you know, things that I liked that they said. Uh, but they were all uh, relentless, just relentless in their pursuit of excellence. Um, you know, they, they were never satisfied with mediocre. They were never satisfied with good. It was always about being better and being the best and constantly striving, I think, for, for excellence. 
well, talking about taking pieces of people, your father was a Marine and I understand he was also a champion hurdler at Vanderbilt and it was he who encouraged your really love of sport. But how was his influence visible in your approach to leadership today? Well, Paul, you've been reading my background, haven't you? You've been checking up on me. I have. Um, exactly right. My father was a Marine, so he instilled in us some of those militaristic uh, characteristics of uh, being demanding, attention to detail, uh, persevering, uh, and being highly competitive. I think at an early age, he taught me uh, about being competitive and striving to win, um, and I think as I grew older, I had to kind of calm down that striving to win. You know, sometimes you get so caught up in it, you're willing to do whatever to win, but then learning how to, to win, but not at all costs, you know, just get it, keep it under control. But he definitely had that impact on me. And I think it was because of his Marine background and his, his athletic background at Vanderbilt. So before we get to learning to put that competitive drive in control, let's go on a bit of a journey because your first job, if I've got this right, was at Austin P. Is that how you pronounce it? P? Pronounce it just like it sounds, P. Yeah, yeah Austin P. And you were a physical education instructor, but that was over 50 years ago, Lynn. How did that experience propel you forward? How did it shape you? Well, it was actually 53 years ago, uh, the fall of 1970, when I uh, was hired at Austin P. And I was hired as a physical education instructor. Uh, I taught the one-hour PE course courses. But now, remember, this is before Title IX. Uh, so it was really important to me because I did not get to play in college. I did not get to compete uh, in college. There were no scholarships. But I wanted to make sure that young women had the opportunities that I didn't have. And so I also coached volleyball, basketball, and tennis in my free time, and I was the cheerleader sponsor. So it was an enormous um, responsibility, but I was young. I was 21. I was high energy. Um, and so I was able to coach all three of those sports, teach all eight different PE classes, and I'm talking about archery, golf, beginning swimming, stunts and tumbling, you name it, I taught it, uh, and still coach those players. And I love coaching those players looking back because they played because they loved the game. There were no scholarships. You know, we had no budget. We had no transportation. You know, we get in the back of my big red car and drive down the road and play a game and get back in the car and drive back. So it was a, it was a tough time. It was a challenging time. Uh, but I have real fond memories of those women that played because they loved to play. Well, from there, you head over to Ole Miss as the head volleyball and tennis coach. So that was a real treat for me, Paul, because that was the first time I was hired just to coach. Uh, I didn't have to teach any more classes, even though I enjoyed teaching classes. But now I was really focused on, on coaching, um, and I was able to give some, some partial scholarships. We were giving scholarships in volleyball. We were starting to give scholarships in tennis. And so um, I, I was there at a time where we were really building the foundation uh, of their women's programs. And even though I was only there for two years, um, you know, I think I had an impact in that program. But there was also some life lessons in that program that helped you experience and I think really shaped you as you went forward. Could you tell us about those? Well, I think you have to remember now I was working at, at Ole Miss in the 70s. Uh, in the South, and there were still some areas of concern about how we treated people. I know for me, being in an environment where we were limited with the number of Blacks that we could have on our team, we were discouraged from having lesbians on our team. Um, and so I, it was not a, a moment that I really embraced. And I think that's one of the reasons why it was best for me to move on after two years, even though I enjoyed volleyball tennis. And then the, the second year I coached the basketball team uh, and was able to compete at the highest level against Delta State, who was the three-time uh, national champions and, and, and coach against one of the greatest coaches in our game, Margaret Wade. Um, but, but some of the, 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 the philosophy um, at that particular time, I, I just really didn't feel comfortable. And so I left after two years. And you headed over to uni the University of Miami. And, of course, there you became the head <laughs> basketball coach. 
But there your challenge was different, wasn't it? Because you had to build a program from scratch. Yeah, I, I didn't realize I'd left America, you know, when I when I went to Miami, because everybody spoke Spanish but me. And I, you know, this is this was my first real encounter with diversity, you know, with different cultures, with different different backgrounds, with different religions. You know, I grew up a little Southern Baptist. You know, I, I, I just had never been outside of um, Tennessee or Mississippi. And so this was a great learning experience for me uh, about the value of diversity, about the value of different ideas, different people from different backgrounds. And uh, I was challenged with building uh, building programs down there. I gave some, I gave the first full scholarship in, in, in women's basketball. I gave scholarships in volleyball. Um, I even coached the softball team, even though we didn't have scholarships, but it was, uh, uh, I, I was there for nine years and there were, there was a time when they had really, really good, uh, not good, great football, Jimmy Johnson and Howard Schnellenberger and, you know, Bernie Kosar and Benny Test. So it was a great time to be at Miami and I really enjoyed it. And, and I loved building those programs, even though it was very, very difficult. It was, and I had very little staff. That's one thing I've learned, you know, how to, how to get by and make the most of what I've got with the least amount of support. Was it more than just the money and the resources that made it difficult? Well, the resources always, when you're struggling, you don't have your own facility. You have to share the facility with, with uh, intramurals. Um, it was just hard, you know, and then you look, the other teams that you're competing against, Florida, Florida State, you know, they've already made substantial uh, commitments, um, you know, to their women's program. So I was always in that underdog role, you know what I'm saying? We had to overachieve and we had to milk the turnip and get more out of what we had than anybody else. But, you know, I like to challenge. I've always liked to challenge. Thank you underdogs is a, is a theme that runs through your whole story. I wanted to it's ask you. What's the secret when it comes to the mindset of getting the right mindset to be a good competitive underdog? Well, I think, I think it comes to motivation. I think it comes to knowing that you are the underdog and that you're going to be overlooked. Uh, you're going to be unappreciated. Uh, there's going to be some disrespect. And so you can use that um, as motivating factors um, and, and so you can always challenge your players. You know, you you're going to surprise these people. You're going to you're going to upset them. You know, we we were the upset kids. Um, and so there, there were times that I felt like some of those players really re uh, responded uh, to motivation better than some of the elite athletes. You know, so if if you have a sense of entitlement or a sense of complacency that you've already arrived. You're a little bit harder to motivate than the than the underdogs. You talk a lot about mentors, Lynn. I, when I research you, you, there's a lot of interviews where you talk about the great mentors you've had. There's Bunny Vineyard, Nuna Kennard, and Betty Giles. And now you're a, you get mentioned as a mentor to other people. I wanted to ask you, what's the secret to being a good mentor? I think a good mentor is someone that can be a truth teller. You know, you need to be careful when you choose a mentor that all they ever do is praise you. You know, a mentor tells you the good, the bad, and the ugly. A mentor will tell you when you're off track. A mentor will give you an honest opinion. Uh, a mentor will say no. Uh, and a mentor will challenge you to do better. And so I think it's important that you pick someone uh, that will do that for you. You know, you can have a board of governors, you can have a friendship circle if you want somebody over there that's just going to praise you all the time. But you definitely need people um, that, that you can turn to and say, hey, this is happening. What do I need to do? How do I get back on track? And they'll tell you the truth. So it's about truth telling. So talking about getting back on track, you talked earlier about having to learn to keep that competitiveness a little bit under control. Was there a moment or a series of events that sort of led you to understand that? Um, I, you know, it may go back to high school and college. You know, I just couldn't stand to lose. I couldn't stand to lose. You know, in high school, I got to play the old three-on-three -three way for two years. Uh, so I never got enough competitive uh, drive out of my system. 
And then I go to college and there's no teams. And so I'm playing in intramurals and I'm competing to kill everybody and win everything, win the badminton, win the tennis, win the volleyball. Um, it just, and again, I think it was instilled in me by my father, you know, when I was young, that, you know, if you're going to play, play to win. Um, and, and, that, but then as I got older, you know, I'm like, okay, just tone it down, calm down. It's okay to be relentless. Uh, but just make sure you stay on track, you know, that you don't run over people or embarrass people or do anything that, that your grandmother wouldn't be happy about. <laughs> I love that idea of your grandmother. So we get to 1986, Lynn, and you move over to Purdue. And at your first game, you had 500 in the stands. In your last game, if the figures are right, there was 9,000. What were some of the first things you did that drove the success of that program? Well, I think when I left the University of Miami, came back to America, came back to West Lafayette, Indiana, Purdue University, the Big Ten, it was a time of change. You know, this was this was the 80s and Title IX had been passed and schools were starting to give scholarships and resources for assistant coaches. And so I think the time of me going there was perfect with my competitive spirit, um, my knowledge of the game. And I will say this, one of the things that's helped me is my thirst for knowledge. You know, I'm a, I'm a video-aholic. I love to watch video. I love to read coaching books. I love to read coaches. Um, and so I'm constantly learning. I'm always learning. You know, that old saying, when you're through learning, you're through. And so by the time I got to to, to Purdue, I was ready to, to be involved in creating a championship caliber program, you know, that could sustain a long time, forever. Um, and then I had some good assistant coaches. The Midwest is a perfect place to recruit talent. And that's another. The all the pieces that you need were kind of there. I'm not sure Purdue knew what they were doing when they hired me because, you know, uh, they just needed a coach. I'm not sure they needed what I had in mind. You know, I had championships in mind. And so we recruited hard. We worked hard. Uh, we we modeled our program after the other two teams in the Big Ten that were so successful, uh, Iowa with Vivian Stringer and Ohio State with Nancy Darsh. I would tell my players, that's who we want to be. That's how we're going to compete in two years. That's how we're going to compete in three years. And that fourth year, we're going to beat them both. And so I sold my staff and my players on that concept. And, of course, you did beat them both. I have, I have this great quote from you, Lynn. You say, balance is the key in everything, in your personal life, in your professional life, in your three-point shooting, your drives, your post-up. We've got to have balance. So, Lynn, how can we bring more balance to our lives? Well, it's challenging. Uh, if you're highly competitive, if you're striving for success 24-7, um, it's, it's hard. But at the same time, you have to be, you know, you have to be cognizant of, of the concept of less is better. Sometimes less is better. Uh, instead of practicing three hours, let's practice an hour and a half, and maybe we'll get just as much done. You know, instead of spending 10 hours over there at the office, I'm only going to spend five, and now I'm going to spend five with my family. You know, so, so less can be better, and less can also create an opportunity where you're more productive. And so I, I think that, that that's real key when it comes to balance. And if I had a do-over, uh, I would look back to my early years in coaching and I would have spent more time with my family. I would have spent more time with my mother. Uh, I regret that I um, didn't um, do more and spend more time with her. But I learned that lesson, you know, and now at this particular time in my life, I know I can be successful at both a personal life and a professional life. But it took time for me to learn that. When you give advice to other young coaches, because you're still heavily involved with, with many, many coaches, what do you tell them they need to stop doing in order to get that balance right? Hmm. Wow, that's a toughie, Paul. Uh, what do you need to stop doing? Well, I mean, it's probably stop being so hard on yourself. You know, so, so in other words, be patient. Uh, be patient with the journey. Be patient with the process. 
you know, take baby steps. It's, it, it's almost like a child. You know, you have to crawl, you have to walk, and then you have to run. And sometimes you can't s- skip those steps. And so you, you have to be patient with yourself. You have to be understanding that it there is a journey and there is a process. Um, and then you have to be relentless in your your preparation and your knowledge of where you want to go. You have to have a plan. I have to have a vision. I know where I want to go. And then I know how I'm going to get there. A lot of people know where they want to go, but they don't have a plan to get there. So you have to have a plan and then you have to put that plan in action. Well, the story continues. The plan in action continues. Because from <laughs> Purdue, you head off to the fever and you join the fever as a scout in 2003. But in 2012, of course, you're the head coach and you lead them to the championship. And reading about that time, it seems like all the lessons you'd had in your career to that point helped you succeed. But when you transitioned into the pros, what did you find most challenging? Well, my first transition was the ABL, the short-lived grassroots teams, uh, two years, I think, and um, spent two years with them. And then I was given the opportunity to start the Seattle Storm, that expansion team, no team, no, no players, no logo, no nothing. So once again, we're the underdog. Once again, we're the you know, the one that nobody expects to do anything. So I'm a builder. Once again, I had a chance to build from scratch and see what I could put together over a period of time. Uh, I think the biggest thing I learned real quick is that you're working with adults. Um, the, 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 The dynamic between a college coach and their players is like a parent and a child. Um, In the pros, it's it's peer to peer. You know, we're, we're on the same page. You know, uh, I have to communicate with them in an entirely different manner than I would with college young. And so I am open to their ideas. I'm open to their suggestions. I'm going to treat them like an adult. I'm going to expect them to act like an adult. And that was an adjustment for me, because remember, I've been in college now for 26 years where I was the boss my way or the highway. Uh, there was no other highway and there were no other bosses. And so I had to kind of change how I communicated. I had to listen more. I had to be open to what they thought. Um, it, it, it was an adjustment period for me. You're known for your talent identification and evaluation. It's one of your key strengths. I wanted to ask you, Lynn, where do people go wrong when it comes to identifying talent? I think sometimes they're caught up with the athletic ability and skills uh, of an athlete and, and, and are not as investigative on the side of the character. Um, one of the things that I learned, I learned this in college recruiting. When we would go into the home of a recruit and the recruit would be there and the parents and the family, and I watched closely how that recruit treated those parents and if that recruit was rude and disrespectful or treated their parents in any form or fashion that I thought was unacceptable I knew they wouldn't fit and and so that whole character piece um, I, I think when you look at the great teams that sustain great success like Tennessee with Pat Summit like Gino at Connecticut Tara at Stanford um, they bring in highly skilled athletes with strong character skills on and off the court. And so that, that you put that all together and then they're able to sustain that success year after year. Then you also started Coaches for Coaches to help other coaches lead successful programs. Tell us about that. Well, one of the things that I've always felt strongly about is giving back. You know, so many people gave me opportunities. So many people helped me along the way. And then as I as I came to the end of my coaching career, I thought, you know, boy, wouldn't it be great um, to be able to coach coaches? You know, I've coached players now for, I don't know, 40 years. Let, let, let's let's see if there's any interest um, in coaches being coached. Um, and I was surprised, you know, at the opportunities, at, at the coaches that reached out for short term coaching or maybe for the whole season or maybe for more than a year. Um, and so it was, it was, I found it very re- rewarding. Uh, that's actually how I ended up 
coming out of retirement and going back to Kentucky uh, as an assistant coach when Matthew Mitchell reached out to me and said he needed help. And I want to say this about Matthew. I have enormous respect for him because he was able to say, I need help. And I think it's a strength. That's something that a lot of people think, well, gosh, if I ask for help, I'm weak. No, no, no. If you ask for help, you're strong, you're smart. You realize that asking for help is a strength. And so when Matthew asked for help, I said, sure, I'll help you. I didn't realize it was going to be a two-year commitment, but it turned out to be a wonderful experience. And I was able to help him get his program back on track. And, and then I stepped away again uh, and back to my consulting. But I've, you know, uh, my consulting is confidential. Uh, Matthew knows that I talk about him. I use his, him as an example. Um, of how help can help someone. Um, but I, you know, 10 or 15 different coaches, head and assistant that I've worked with through the years. You've created such a great legacy, a legacy of positive change for women. I think that has really helped those that have followed you. But what do you see as the main challenge needs that needs to be addressed for female leaders today? I just think we need to keep growing the visibility of women's sports. Um, I, I've, I've seen the growth uh, through the implementation of Title IX, the resources, the, the commitment. Uh, but now we're right on the cusp of becoming a very visible, viable uh, endeavor. And I saw what happened with, with the soccer team, with the professional soccer team, and how much visibility they've gotten. And then I saw this college season um, with how much interest there was in the, in the women's college game. Nine million viewed the championship game. And so I think in some ways we've, we've been a secret. Uh, these tremendous female athletes have not been able to get their games on TV and consistently, like, how do I find a game? How do I find a game? And so I think we have to be more visible. You know, we have to showcase – um, what we have, the, the, the tremendous individual players like we've seen in tennis, uh, like we've seen in golf. We need to see them in our team sport, softball, volleyball, uh, basketball, college and pro. And so keep pushing for that visibility. One final question, Lynn. You're still coaching. You're still the GM out there at Indiana. It seems like there's no end in sight for you. But in your quiet moments, when you do reflect, what is it? that you hope is the legacy you've left with all of these people that you've, you've, you've coached over the years? Well, I, I think that's, that's an interesting thought for me because I've been involved so many times with building a program, with building a program or rebuilding a program. So I, there's no doubt that I am a, I am a builder. Um, and I cherish that. I, I like that. I like that I'm known as someone that can build a program a, build it from no success or little success to great success. And, and so I, I'm, I'm proud of that. And so at the end of the day, I think my legacy would be wherever she worked, whoever she worked with, they got better. They got better. Whether it was a 1% every day or 100% from the beginning to the end, wherever she worked, they got better. If I was to challenge you, Lynn, I'd also say, you've paved the way for many other women who have followed. I hope so. I really hope so. I'm proud of that too. Lynn, it's been great chatting to you today and, and reading about you and getting to know a little bit more of your story. So thank you for your time and I wish you all the best for the second half of the season with Indiana. Thank you, Paul. It's been fun. Hi, everyone. You have been listening to the great coach, Lynn Dunn. I hope you got a lot out of Lynn's infectious energy and her lovely accent and found a couple of ideas that you can bring back to your own team. Some of the ideas that resonated with me were the role she plays as a mentor and the passionate advocacy she has for surrounding yourself with people who, in her words, give you an honest opinion and challenge you to do better. And her experiences with racial prejudice and sexual discrimination when coaching in the 1970s and how she persevered in finding ways around it. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. And just before we go, if you have any feedback, then please let us know. Just like John Kessel, a great coach that we've interviewed on the podcast who said, 
two guys doing some solid interviews with great coaches from all over the world. Great nuggets of learning. Thanks, John. We just love the interaction with the people all around the world who listen. And so if you have any feedback, please let us know. And if it's positive, then let your friends know too. All the details on how to connect with us are in the show notes or on our website, thegreatcoachespodcast.com.